You all know Jonathan Faulkner as a fellow seminary student. You maybe met him on the ultimate Frisbee field as well. Jonathan grew up in Ohio and pastored in Kansas before coming to GCTS. If you spent any time with Jonathan, you know that he loves theology and church history, music, and helping people in Jesus' name. His interest in these areas spills out in engaging conversations and an excellent blog that he writes. And I'm certain that Jonathan would be happy to talk with you about any subject. <laughs> but if you bring up NASCAR, Star Trek, or the importance of being a voice for overlooked people, you will have found a kindred spirit in Jonathan. I know Jonathan as my son-in-law. He married my daughter, Rachel, last May. <laughs> in our back backyard in Northfield, Massachusetts. And I pastor a small church in Northfield. It's D.L. Moody's hometown. Uh, as my wife, uh, Wendy, she's with us this morning, and I considered the resources and qualities we would desire of the Christian husband for our only daughter. You might think that the list would be long, and actually, it was a very short list. Just this. Is he kind? Is he kind? Uh, kindness was the one measurement that mattered to us. Jonathan fits that bill. And as he comes to speak as a minister of God's word, and knowing that many of you here are in training for pastoral ministry, I remind you, insofar as kindness is a revealer of the presence of agape love, it is the only measurement that matters to Jesus. And I could make a case by this by unpacking the instruction of, from 1 Corinthians 13, but it's not my day to speak in chapel. <laughs> it's Jonathan's. He has that privilege, so I give to you Jonathan Faulkner. Amen. Good morning. E.M. E. Bounds, in his book, Power Through Prayer, says it takes 20 years to write a sermon because it takes... 20 years to prepare the man. And I don't know if that's true, but this particular sermon, it's taken about three years to write, and I think it's one of those cases where the sermon has written me. Because three years ago, in February, I was at work on a normal day, minding my own business. I was in my tent-making job because I was also pastoring, and I climbed into the back of a dump truck to empty a bag of leaves and fell out of the back of the back of the dump truck. When I woke up, I was surrounded by students and medical personnel. I was being asked the concussion protocol questions, none of which I answered in a timely manner. I was taken to the hospital where I had brain scans and blood work done and you name it. And in that time, they came back and said, you have a level one traumatic brain injury. Life stopped. For the next month, in the initial outset of the recovery process, I dealt with all manner of darkness. I was even sent to my grandparents' farm in Illinois because I was struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts. I was angry with God was angry with people in general. I was on this mood swing pendulum that was about as unpredictable for me as it was the people around me. I called 2015 my Job year, and 2015 was also when I came to seminary. And surprisingly, when I came here, I still did not have my short-term memory restored, and I was trying to take Greek. <laughs> and you think Greek is tough now? But in January, when I was cleared by the neurologist, he actually said it was probably the Greek, the, memor the memorization, the repetition that helped me restore, that, that God used to restore. All right, so the bottom line is Greek is useful for something other than exegesis. Who knew, Dr. K? 
But in that time, in about a month in, I knew I couldn't continue to be in the darkness I was in. So right before Easter, I decided to just take a step back. I took a week off from church, which I was a Baptist pastor at the time, so you could do that two weeks before Easter. <laughs> I'm in the 4C now, so that's a little trickier. But I took a week off. I spent that time devoting myself to scripture and to prayer, and God began to unpeel the layers of emotional hurt and physical pain that had been undealt with, but when you have a brain injury, instantly comes to the surface. And he began a healing work that was long overdue. But in that moment, I cried out. I cried out for mercy. Today in our text, as we look at the 10th chapter of Mark, verses 46 through 52, we find another one, person who's crying out. I call it a prayer of desperation. A prayer of desperation. We find a man named Bartimaeus. Let's read together the holy word of God. Mark 10, 46 through 52. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples... And a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him, be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. May God bless to our hearts this reading of his holy word. This was a normal practice. In 8, if you read the grand narrative of Mark, the short narrative of Mark, in fact, a professor of mine called it the comic book gospel in undergrad. They start this journey in eight, this journey to Jerusalem. And by the way, that journey also starts with a story about a blind man. So they start this journey to Jerusalem. It's a common practice. It's high festival season. It's time to go for Passover supper. And Jesus is going for another reason. So they begin this trek down to Jerusalem from Galilee. And to do that, you had to pass through Jericho. It's the final city, if you will, on, before you start the ascent to Jerusalem. And so the disciples have had all these encounters starting in chapter 8. And now they've come to Jericho and they're one day away. And through this time, we know in the text that it's no longer just Jesus and the disciples, but Jesus and the crowd. So a group of pilgrims have joined them on the way, making the same journey that they are up to Jerusalem to go and make sacrifices in the temple, partake of the Passover dinner feast, And so they're all making their trek through Jerusalem. And they come through to Jerusalem. And they come through Jericho. And as they're leaving Jericho, on these dusty streets, probably midday, getting ready to ascend to, or early morning, getting ready to ascend to Jerusalem, they come across this beggar, this Bartimaeus, 
And it's been a long journey. I'm sure a lot of them wanted to get there. I'm sure a lot of them wanted to get there so they could get lodging. The, the population of Jerusalem during this time would swell to over a million people. And so they come across this blind man on the road. And Mark puts him leaving as they're leaving the city. Luke actually has him as they're entering the city. But Mark puts him at the end of this part of the narrative. The very end, literally. Because it's the last gate they'll go through before heading to Jerusalem. It's also the last healing in the book of Mark. So they come across Bartimaeus. And he's sitting on the road, as he would have, begging, hoping that the pilgrims would, would drop food or give money that he might carve out some kind of living. He'd probably been carried there in the morning by a relative, as was common. Or maybe he even had to stay there himself. Either way, he's not the type that we see earlier in the narrative when a rich man comes to Jesus. He's not a little child who also comes to Jesus and probably the children of the pilgrims that were traveling. He's a blind man, a beggar, the son of Timaeus. And he's sitting here by the side of the road And he hears who's coming. And here you can see the crowd, probably joyous shouts and, and praise as they make, get ready to make the ascension to Jerusalem. And he starts to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he gets louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It gets louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And now the crowd starts to hear him and they say, be silent. Sit back down on your mat. Don't bother the teacher. They rebuke him sharply. But this only causes him, as it tends to do, to cry out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, I, I call this a prayer, and I believe it is. I believe this is the type of prayer that when we don't know how to be made in the image of God, as Brother Mateos talked to us about last week, when we don't know how to do that, sometimes that prayer comes out audibly. And I think this is that prayer. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And this prayer has actually been used as a prayer throughout the ages. In the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church today, you still use this prayer as part of the liturgy, part of the flow of the service. And some, in the, and in the monasteries and the convents, it was used as a repetitive prayer. Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or it was used as a penitential prayer. But here is a desperate crying out of a man who has no other option and who has enti his entire life sat by the side of the road and here comes his chance. He, he's probably heard of Jesus of Nazareth. It's entirely logical that the stories of Jesus had been circulating around Jericho and Jerusalem as he'd already been. John uh, has him cleaning the temple early. So, we, you know, it's possible he was in Jerusalem multiple times in his life. We know he was. If you read the other Gospels, even in Mark, he's there prior to this trip. And so he knows who he's calling out to. So take note, then, of one of the phrases here. He says, Jesus, son of David. 
Now, in the book of Mark, if you read some of the commentators, they talk about the messianic secret. I don't necessarily think that's what's going on, that Jesus' identity is always hidden in the book of Mark. It is true that earlier in the narrative, Peter has professed him as Jesus the Christ, and Jesus has forbid him from telling anyone that. But he says, Jesus, son of David. He knows who he's talking to. This isn't some mere pilgrim from Nazareth. This isn't some just Jesus, because Jesus was one of the most popular names of this time period. This wasn't just Jesus of Jericho. This was Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David. The heir to the Davidic throne. The one prophesied by Isaiah. The one prophesied by Jeremiah. This is the one who is going to come and restore the kingdom of Israel. So when Bartimaeus cries out, Jesus, son of David, he's crying out to the one who's going to restore the kingdom. And maybe that's what's happening in the crowd's minds too because this kind of language would stir up for them nationalist and royal ideology invoking the name of their greatest king when Israel was at its height of power and wealth. Jesus, the son of David. And so maybe... The reason the crowd rebukes him is because in their mind, they don't know who he is. They, they're thinking, yes, military, we're going to overthrow Rome. Lower taxes. Make Israel great again. <laughs> That's the crowd, not Jesus. <laughs> but Bartimaeus, and Bartimaeus makes this as a messianic pronouncement. He's not just talking about the one who will restore, who will sit on the Davidic throne, but the one who will restore not just the military fortunes, but the personal capital. He's the Jesus of Nazareth, the one who has done healing miracles who's healed two bl one blind man already in Mark's narrative. This is the Jesus who came to seek and save and who constantly in Mark is eating with the outcast, is with the ones that nobody wants and the disciples are consistently trying to deny access. Because in their mind, he's going to overthrow Rome. Yeah, it's going to be great. But they're, they've missed the point. And the second half of, you know, the second, at the beginning, the disciples kind of get it. And Mark. In the second part of Mark, they don't get anything. This is Jesus, the son of David. And so he cries out, and the crowd silences him. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't join the crowd. He says, call him. Two words, call him. Two words spoken with so much authority that the crowd turns to Bartimaeus and says, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And Bartimaeus throws off his cloak. You can imagine the joy, the, um, the amazement that he's being called by Jesus of Nazareth. And the crowd has stopped their rebuke, but they're telling him, go to him. He's calling you. Jesus, son of David, is calling you. The Christ, the Messiah, he's calling you. So he gets up. And he says, Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? And, and this question can trip us up a little bit because, you know, we're like, well, duh, Jesus, he wants you to heal him or something. <laughs> Let's remember, though, that in, in Mark 10, three, or in, since chapter 8, or no, yeah, in Mark 10, 
Three people have come to him asking for something already. The rich man who wanted salvation without sacrifice. James and John who wanted power without service. And now the blind man is asking for something. So he says, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, Rabboni. I want to receive my sight. And he does. Jesus says, go your own way. Your faith has made you well. And the blind man becomes a follower, maybe even a disciple. It's possible that that's why he's named. It's possible he becomes so well known among the disciples in the community where Mark is, that Mark is writing to that that's why he's named in the text. He's the only one who's healed, by the way, that's named. And he follows Jesus. He receives his sight and disciples himself to Jesus. Now, what about us? It'd be very easy in applying this text as a historian to say that there have been times when the church in the West has been the crowd before Jesus called to him and silenced them. It would be very easy to go that direction. And indeed, we wouldn't be off. One only has to look at why our churches are so segregated. Or look at the history of how we have, as the white church, treated both slaves and former slaves or Native Americans or immigrants, or refugees. And we could have a conversation about that, and I'm willing to have a conversation like that, but there is something more pressing on my heart this morning. Because brothers and sisters, for the last 16 months, I have been uh, with you in another way. I, I've been serving for the last year on student association and I've taken it upon myself to hear you, to listen. To be in those moments with you, whether it's in the lunch line in the cafeteria or to have deeper conversations on the sidewalks or in the great hall or in here. I've wanted to listen and I've found that our community is in a season where we are crying out. We are praying the prayer of desperation, myself included. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And it's not necessarily because of physical blindness. There's hurt, emotional and physical. There's depression. There's anxiety. There's suicidal ideations. There's fear. And those stem from a number of different causes. Some of it is a workload that some of us feel too overborne by, too weighed down by. Some of it is social media and all the negativity that we face day to day just by scrolling through your Facebook news feed. And some of it is our interactions with one another. Or interactions with those who are supposed to be leading us and caring. We are anxious. We are hurting. We are broken. And some of us have heard the voice of the crowd when we try and speak up about this, and so we stop speaking up. Be silent. Stop. 
Wait your time. The teacher has no time for you. And some of us don't, don't cry out because we don't believe that Jesus can do the thing we need him to do. And so we suffer in silence, claiming to worship a God, but the God we worship can't do what we need and isn't the God of the universe, is not this Jesus, son of David. And we don't go to him. We don't call to him. Oh, brothers and sisters, little flock, you were loved. You were dear. And some of us have heard you. And some of us have joined you because we're crying out as well. But here's the thing. Jesus is calling you. Get up. Take off your cloak and go to him. Do you hear me? Jesus is calling you in the middle of your darkness, in the middle of your pain, in your deepest hurts. Jesus is calling you in your anxiety. Jesus is calling you. Hear that. Believe it. And in hearing and believing then, I charge you to take it to those who aren't here. See those who didn't come to this place today and who don't normally come to this place. Whether it's students in your classrooms or your peers in the hallway or cafeteria, take this message to them. Jesus is calling you and he wants to deliver you and he will deliver you because he is who he says he is he is the Messiah and for those who have heard the cry and continued the blindness of the disciples at the beginning continued silencing and rebuking, I charge you to stop and hear that Jesus is calling you as much as he's calling the rest of us. Brothers and sisters, little flock, we cannot effectively minister to a hurting world, a world that compounds hurt upon hurt every single day unless we are effectively ministering and pointing one another to Jesus Christ. Remember that as we go from this place. And I challenge you all to live the gospel you speak and continue to walk in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is calling you. Get up. And once you've heard that and gone to him, continue to follow him. You are loved. Amen.